Okay, hi everyone. Um, we should be live right now. Let me bring up one thing. Oh yeah, we are. Um, so it's great to see everybody again. Um, we are, I am Danielle Snowflack um, and I am the Senior Director of Education at Edvotech. Um, and we are happy to be um, talking with you today about a new electrophoresis experiment. Um, this is gonna be one that simulates uh, the COVID RT-PCR test. So this is super exciting, our grand launch of a new kit. Um, and so we're gonna be revisiting um, the biology of the COVID of COVID-19, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and a little bit about the, the ways that we test um, for, uh, for um, COVID disease. So I, oh, let me go back here. Um, so, uh, many of you have joined us before, but for those of you who are new, welcome. Um, we are Edvotech. We are the biotechnology education company. Um, we were founded over 30 years ago, um, by Dr. Jack Trichin, a professor of biochemistry at Georgetown University. Um, and again, you know, if we think back to, um, the innovations that were going on in biotechnology at this time period, um, you know, there were so many amazing things happening. Recombinant DNA technology was becoming um, a, a prevalent technique in the laboratories. Um, you know, the polymerase chain reaction was developed and PCR um, is a, an integral technique to this COVID testing that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, being able to produce enzymes and bacteria. We'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, but there was just so many um, pivotal um, discoveries being made. And so little of this was being translated into the classroom at this time. And so, um, you know, this is where the genesis, this, this gave us the genesis of Edvotech. So how can we translate these amazing scientific discoveries into something that makes science awesome for kids? And so um, Edvotech, our focus is solely in the education sector. Um, so we really want to work with educators around the world to demystify science and to foster the next generation of scientists through hands-on active learning activities. And by saying that we are an education company, um, you know, it doesn't mean that what we're doing, the equipment we're making, um, can't be used in undergrad research labs as well. Um, or, you know, even in your research lab if you need um, some, you know, really robust equipment. So, um, you know, welcome. Um, let's get to the experiment. So, oh, I hit the wrong button again. It's that kind of day, I suppose, friends. Um, so today's experiment, again, is a brand new experiment. So this is um, the um, Evotech Kit 123, Nucleic Acid Testing for COVID-19. Um, and this is going to be a simulated test. So please remember, um, this is not going to be able to test for the SARS-CoV-2 virus in your body. Um, this is a simulation of the testing that your doctor would order um, and the analysis of those results. So I just wanna make that perfectly clear. Um, you know, when you get this experiment, you will be doing electrophoresis. Um, now, um, this experiment is going to simulate the molecular testing of patient samples to detect the presence of that SARS-CoV-2 genome in patient samples. Molecular tests are highly sensitive assays that use the polymerase chain reaction, um, PCR, to um, be able to look for the presence of the viral genome within patient samples. And so for COVID-19, this test looks for those, the genome in the patient samples. And that would mean that a person has been infected with the virus. Um, we're gonna run this test from start to finish in the time that we are here in this workshop. So, you know, under an hour. Um, you know, I'll probably talk a lot. So if you talk less than me, um, you can probably make it a little shorter, but I like to make sure everybody has the information that they need to do this experiment and to really understand the background and why what we're doing is important. Um, so over the course of this workshop, we're gonna talk, talk about transmission and testing for coronavirus uh, and the science behind why it works. So a little bit about coronaviruses. Um, so, I mean, by now um, we've all heard of coronavirus. Um, but SARS-CoV-2 may have been the first coronavirus that you've heard of, but they're not rare um, and they don't just affect humans. 
So coronaviruses are going to affect a wide range of animals, including birds, bats, cattle, and dogs. And actually, before I move forward, I just want to um, stop and say um, we are um, giving out professional de development certificates um, for those who attend this workshop. Um, and we'll also be sending out the slides after the workshop. So if you would like to um, get this information, please be sure to click the link that is in the chat window right now. Um, complete the form and we will send you the slides um, and we will send you a professional development certificate um, for having attended. So back to the science. So SARS-CoV-2 might be the first coronavirus you've heard of, um, but they, they're not rare, nor do they just affect humans. Um, coronaviruses affect birds, bats, cattle, and even our cats and dogs. Um, there was a case of a tiger getting a COVID-19 disease in New York City. Um, so, you know, the, the viruses are able to, um, you know, affect many different species. Um, the first coronaviruses were actually identified in the 1930s. Um, and to date, there are seven identified ver like strains of coronavirus that do cause disease in humans. Of these, four strains um, are responsible for between 15 and 30 percent of common cold cases every year. Um, it's going to be different depending on the year, um, you know, but um, in general, these symptoms are mild and include fever and sore throat, you know, the kind of thing you would take some Advil and rest, you know, with some chicken soup and a good book. Um, but, you know, sometimes a novel strain of the virus emerges that is going to cause severe respiratory disease. And there are three of them that have been identified to date. Um, two of them were identified, um, you know, well, like a, quite a while ago. So there was um, SARS um, in 2003 and MERS in 2012. So these are two um, variety of coronaviruses which have been shown to, um, you know, have severe respiratory effects. And this year, um, in beginning in 2019, um, you know, we started to be affected by COVID-19. Um, and that was traced to the emergence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, which we're going to expose, discuss in depth in a little further into this workshop. Um, but I just want to give you a couple important definitions. Um, you know, I'll be using these terms through the workshop, but I think it's really important to understand the difference um, between the two. Um, to SARS-CoV-2, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, that's a mouthful, um, now that's the name of the coronavirus responsible for the current epidemic. So the systematic name, um, you know, that, you know, describes the virus itself. So that's like its species, essentially. Um, uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus disease 2019 is the, the name for the disease. So the symptoms, uh, the collective uh, symptoms that um, are caused by SARS-CoV-2. Um, so according to the World Health Organization, this virus, um, you know, again, first originated in 2019, um, spread worldwide in a very short period of time. And so public health officials are continuing to work on strategies um, to be able to identify infected individuals, contract trace to any people who they may have been in touch with, um, and, and to prevent the, the further spread of the virus. So um, we know that... Um, a lot of people um, have mild symptoms of COVID-19 or even no symptoms. Um, so some of the symptoms include fever, cough, shortness of breath. Um, but there are a number of severe cases um, where patients may have pneumonia, respiratory distress, severe respiratory distress where they need oxygen or a ventilator um, and or kidney failure. Um, recently, something um, that doctors have been seeing more and more of is a linkage to blood clotting disorders. Um, which is different from the other coronaviruses. Um, so, um, and it's an interesting emergence and it's something that medical professionals are learning to be able to tr diagnose and treat um, as part of this um, disease. And so sadly, you know, um, this infection can be fatal. Um, if you do survive a serious case, you may have long um, lasting effects from the virus and, and we're learning more every day um, about the effects on human physiology. Um, treatment for COVID-19 um, includes rest fluids and over-the-counter medications if you're at home. Um, there are a couple promising um, candidates for um, treatment if you are in the hospital with a severe case. Um, and researchers are currently developing vaccines and antiviral medications to further combat this infection. So, um, one th oh. 
So prevention is the best medicine. So with proper precautions, we can prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, coronaviruses like SARS-CoV-2 um, are spread from person to person through liquid droplets that come out when you cough or sneeze. So respiratory droplets um, that will can be spread six feet or more, um, you know, from the velocity of your sneezes. Um, but luckily, soap and hand sanitizer and other disinfectants can kill these viruses pretty easily. So just by washing your hands, we can limit the spread of the disease. Um, it's an envelope virus, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But envelope viruses are, are very um, easy to denature, easy to kill using soap and other detergents to break them up. Um, touching your hands, we want to make sure not to touch our faces um, because touching your face with contaminated hands can introduce the virus to your mucous membranes, your eyes and your nose. Um, your mouth. Um, and so it's important to keep your hot eye, your hands away from these areas. Um, we can wear cloth masks to cover the mouth and nose, um, which is going to prevent the spread of our respiratory droplets um, to other people and also kind of be mindful of not touching your face. Um, furthermore, while this disease is spreading, um, we can take actions like social distancing to reduce the likelihood of infecting those around us, which would then spread the disease. And so the most important thing is that if you are really sick and you are exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19, um, please reach out to your doctor, your local health um, professionals um, to get tested. Um, you know, you really want to make sure to um, take precautions not to affect the people around you. Um, and you know what, there's a lot of misinformation on the internet right now um, about COVID-19, some of which is intentionally misleading. Um, and so, you know, you're going to want to talk to your doctor or refer to sites um, that are reputable, like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, the CDC, or the World Health Organization um, for information. And so that's actually a reason why using um, a, a, a lesson that talks about coronavirus, about COVID, is great in your classroom laboratory, because you can start to help your students think about the sources for information that they see online and critically evaluating information um, you know, before making decisions um, and you're just really learning the source of that information, why it's important, where it's coming from. Um, and so um, there are a couple ways that we can test for um, COVID-19. Um, one is going to be an immunoassay. And so that um, is an immunological test. Um, that is actually going to look for the antibodies to COVID-19 in a patient's um, either blood or their um, nasal secretions. Um, that is looking for the method, the molecular mechanisms within the body that are used to target and kill the disease. Um, molecular tests, in contrast, are going to use um, PCR to identify the presence of the viral genome, which is gonna signify an active infection. And so the genome is, we can think of it like a virus's instruction book. Um, so the instructions for how the virus takes over your cells, builds more viruses, and breaks your cells open to infect more people. Um, and this um, instruction book codes for structural proteins and ne necessary enzymes for the virus to invade your body. Now, it's important to note that a positive test does not mean that a patient is going to become seriously ill or even show any symptoms. Um, however, these diagnoses are important because they're going to allow epidemiologists to trace the spread of COVID-19. So the, um, one of the assays um, is this COVID-19 immunoassay, and I actually spoke about this in a previous live stream. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it today, but I just wanted to make sure um, you know, that you knew uh, it existed and what, a little bit about it. Um, and so most ELISAs for the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus look for antibodies in the sample. And these are antibodies um, either from our first line of defense where the immune system, the body's um, you know, attack system, um, I first identifies the virus and um, targets it for destruction. Um, and then the second sort of antibody that it's looking for, the IgG, is a long-term immunity. So these are the antibodies that are built after your virus has had it, uh, it been in your body for a little while and would allow it to target and kill the virus were you to be reinfected. Um, one problem with this test is that once the patient's body has cleared the infection, uh, no, this isn't a problem. Um, one of the reasons we use the immunoassay is because um, once the patient's body has cleared the viral genome out of the body, no nucleic acid is going to remain present. Um, and so the antibodies actually let us know whether a person or not has been infected. 
And this is super important because if you weren't tested when you were sick, um, but you were able to get to a doctor later, um, you know, they could determine whether or not you'd been infected by SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and then that can go into um, modeling the spread of the disease around your community. Um, and so um, one problem is that since the body does not produce these antibodies until after you've been infected, uh, several days after you've been infected, the virus, the test you're going to want to take, um, you know, when you're in the early stages of infection or even asymptomatic will be that viral test, um, which will let you know that you're sick before a lot of the clinical um, symptoms arise. Okay, so um, let's dig into the molecular test um, a little more. Um, so here is a delightful graphic showing about how you're going to be swabbed um, for um, SARS-CoV-2. But these molecular tests, um, they are used by clinical and public health laboratories around the world to identify active COVID-19 infection because they're going to look for the virus by looking for its genome. Uh, molecular tests are very sensitive. Um, they can detect very, very low amounts of the virus. So in the early days of the infection, before the virus is really reproducing in your body. Um, so, uh, and that's important um, in early diagnosis and to prevent spread. Um, and these tests are very sensitive, but again, after the infection is cleared, you know, we need to rely on the amino assay to tell who has been infected. So to perform the molecular test, we first need to get the sample. So most of them are taken from this nasopharyngeal swab. Um, and so if you've ever had a, a rapid flu test or if you have been tested for COVID, um, you know that you take this sterile swab and it feels like it is being pushed all the way back into your brain. But really it is going um, through the nostril and into the upper part of your throat and sinuses. Um, so basically right behind your nose. Um, the swab is kind of um, moved around, um, it goes in through the second nostril, um, and it's able to absorb the nasal secretions um, in your sinuses, um, so that's going to get the mucus. Um, it's going to get any viral or bacterial particles that are residing in your sinus, and it's also going to get some human cells because the cell, you know, we are in your head, um, we are in your sinuses, and those cells are going to be shedding at a regular rate as well. Um, so in the lab, the clinical lab tech is going to extract nucleic acid um, from the sample and then testing it using reverse transcription PCR, um, which is going to produce a signal if the viral genome um, is present in the sample. And today we're going to be doing a, simulating, a simulation of that um, by testing samples, uh, analyzing samples in a ready-to-load um, DNA simulation. And so... Um, if you've done electrophoresis before, you have seen some of this. Um, so what do we need? Let me switch over so that I can show you um, everything that we are working on. All right, so here is my setup. I'm gonna get some gloves on. You know, we always wanna make sure to use proper protective equipment um, when doing our scientific experiments. Um, so I'm gonna have gloves on. Um, so um, what are we gonna need to um, do electrophoresis experiments? Um, so first of all, it's important to note that electrophoresis is a super versatile technique. Um, you know, we're going to be using it to um, look at DNA samples, um, which are in this quick strip format. So they're pre aliquoted for you. So you don't need to do any of that work um, before doing this experiment in your classroom. You don't have to aliquot them. Um, so these samples contain um, the DNA. They contain um, dyes. They contain everything you need to do. Um, in this technique, it's a simulation. Um, to analyze the products from our molecular virus testing. So agarose is the medium for our separation. Um, it comes as a powder, um, but basically it is a scientific jello. Um, the agarose is gonna act like a molecular strainer or sieve, um, which is going to allow us to separate these DNA molecules by size. And I'll talk more about that later in the workshop. Um, we also have our electrophoresis buffer. It is a mixture of buffers and salts. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why we use this um, for electrophoresis. One is that water is a really poor conductor of electricity. So the combination of buffers and salts allow the electricity to flow through um, and move our samples in our electrophoresis gel. Um, and next we're using a biological samples and we wanna keep them at the correct pH so that they are charged and the electri electrical current affects them and allows them to run through the gel. Um, and so with our kits, we supply our 50XTAE as a concentrate. Um, and we do have a video on our YouTube channel about dilutions. 
Um, it's a very popular one if you want your students to learn more about dilutions. Now, before doing this experiment, oh, I got some fuzz on there. Um, thank you, Kat. Um, but uh, if you want to learn more about dilutions, we have a YouTube video for that. You can have your students watch before performing the dilution of the electrophoresis buffer. Um, so I'm gonna move the electrophoresis tank in here. Um, this is our chamber. Um, so um, this is going to hold our gel, our electrophoresis gel. Um, let me place this in there. Um, and so what you can see is that um, we have our gel. It's again, our science jello. Um, and it's going to go into this buffer tank and it fits right in. Um, I love this because the gel, the, the, the gel can only fit into the buffer chamber in one direction. Um, the lid can only fit on one, um, in one direction. Um, it, it basically student proofs your experiment. So you have to run your samples, um, correctly, which I personally, um, love because I know we've all been there, um, on a rough day when you accidentally run the gel the wrong way and all of your samples go the wrong way and you're so upset because you've wasted them. Um, and so this kind of allows you to student proof some of the easiest places to make mistakes. Today I'm using the, um, Edvotech M12 which runs two gels concurrently. Um, the leads from the lid are plugged into our Edvotech DuoSource 150, um, which can actually power two M12s at a time. So if we're teaching in the lab using this setup, we could actually accommodate up to 24 students, which would be four lab group groups with six students each. And then finally, we need to get our samples into the gel, and I'm gonna do that with an adjustable volume micropipette. So oftentimes, we're gonna use an adjustable volume micropipette because oftentimes in the laboratory, we need to load very small amounts of sample. And so um, sometimes it's less than the volume of a raindrop. And so um, these allow us to make the measurements um, and make them be um, reproducible and the same every time. And so what you can see is I'm using this micro pipette and I'm going to use it to remove the sample from my quick strip. You need to puncture the foil first, um, insert your pipette tip underneath the sample, um, and then we are gonna load. Um, and I always, if I'm loading around my camera and so sometimes that is a little tricky, um, but I am doing it so that you can get the heads up view of what I'm doing. And you can see that sample went into the well. Um, and so each of our samples, the DNA is um, very concentrated and it is going to be, um, You'll, know, you'll notice that these concentrated DNA samples sink right into the wells. And that's because our DNA is um, sent to you um, in the quick strips already in the loading dye. And the loading dye is a buffer solution that's gonna help keep our DNA charged um, and stable. Um, not only that, um, the, we have glycerol in there, which is gonna make our samples more dense than water. Because you could imagine if our DNA samples were just um, just resuspended in water, you know, it, we would add our DNA and float right out of that well because the density is the same. Um, by adding glycerol, we make our samples heavier um, than the buffer so that they do sink into these wells in the agarose gel. Um, and then we also have a dye in there. Um, DNA is clear and colorless. And so the dye is going to let us see how far um, our gel runs. And so we try to um, make these experiments as robust as possible, but mistakes happen. Um, you know, like for instance, you can see that I'm changing the tip between every sample and I do this to prevent cross-contamination. Um, should your samples get cross-contaminated, um, you know, that's a great place to talk to your students about experimental error, um, you know, and the ways that science can go wrong and to really critically evaluate the experiment um, and to determine what they would do next time, correctly next time. And so, um, you know, for those of you who have joined me before, um, you know that I have made some mistakes. Um, you know, I've caught myself making mistakes and stopped it. Um, and I think it's important for our students to see this, to really understand that, you know, scientists are human, um, you know, and, you know, science is messy. It's not always perfect and we don't always get the right results every time. Um, and so that it's really, um, if good to have your students reflect on this in their lab notebooks after performing the experiments, um, you know, because they really are, will be looking at things more as a scientist than um, simply as a student and really understanding more about the process of science. All right, so I have got this loaded. All right, um, and so um, what I am going to do um, is I am going to put the lid on um, oops, sorry. Um, 
you're going to get a little seasick from all the bumping that I've done of the lid. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, if you've tried doing electrophoresis live streaming, um, you know, there are little bumps along the way. Um, but, you know, we try our best to, um, you know, get around them and make it work out well. Okay. And so I've got the cover on. I've turned the current on. Um, you know, you'll be able to see the loading die go through the gel. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about our electrophoresis chambers. All right. So... Um, the equipment you need for electrophoresis, again, so our buffer chamber um, is really important. It's going to have the electrodes that are going through the, the, the electrodes that are going to help produce the current that moves the DNA through the gel. Um, our, um, we, we, they, it holds the buffer, it holds the gels. Um, you can see that all of our buffer chambers, our electrophoresis chambers come with the casting trees and combs you need to actually make the agarose gel. And if you want to learn more about the technical part of making the gels, I've covered that in a couple of live streams. And we also have tutorials again on our YouTube page. So you can see step-by-step step how to pour the gel. Um, but all of our electrophoresis chambers come with the casting trays and combs that you need to make your electrophoresis gels. Again, the unit I am making is the M12, which runs up to two gels at once. So if you're in a teaching lab, we could accommodate 12 students, um, which would be two lab groups with six students each. Um, we also offer an M36, which you can see on the slide, which can actually run six gels at once, um, which is, you know, more than an entire classroom worth of students. It's 36 students in one gel, um, which I think is pretty amazing. I don't know if you guys think it's amazing. Um, you know, you can let me know in the chat um, if, you know, you're doing electrophoresis, um, you know, with our equipment um, and how it works for you if you're using the M36. Um, and so again, um, you know, this is a pretty amazing way to be able to bring this biotechnology into your classroom. So we've got power supplies. And so I, I wanted to have the setup show the gel so you can see the, the gel, the um, loading die moving through the gel. And so we can monitor the progress um, of our electrophoresis experiment. So I don't actually have the power supply here where you can see it, but here is a picture of it. It looks the same. Um, we're using the Duosource 150 today. Um, so we hook up our electrodes um, to the power supply and there it's going to generate the current that we need to perform the separation. Um, so the Duosource 150 can run two gels at 75 or 150 volts. And so if we actually included two M12, uh, you can attach two M12s to this power supply, uh, meaning that you can accommodate up to 24 students with two gel boxes and one power supply. Um, and now that's going to be the right voltage for the vast majority of our experiments. Um, but if you wanted to run four electrophoresis chambers, or maybe do polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, you'd want to consider the quadrosource, um, which is fully adjustable over multiple voltages. Um, and now I want to show you one of our coolest new things, um, which I am super... And if you're looking for a really nice compact all-in-one solution um, that has a power supply, the electrophoresis chamber, and the visualization system all-in-one, um, we've just introduced the Edvotech Edge. Um, and this unit combines everything into one compact and pretty amazing looking unit. And so, um, you know, I've gotten my hands on it and it is fun. Uh, it's fun to use and it's, uh, it's really nice because you can actually see the DNA migrating through the gel as you're running the electrophoresis. So if you look at our gel right now, our M12, you can see the loading die has left the wells um, and is starting to migrate through the gel. And that's a good sign. That means we've set up our electrodes correctly. Um, and that our DNA is moving through the gel and we're going to be able to get good results. Okay, well, so let's move back to Corona. Um, let's talk more about the coronavirus and look more in depth um, at the virus itself. And so here is a, an image of a coronavirus collected using electron microscopy, um, uh, which is going to let us to visualize objects that are incredibly tiny, so mere nanometers in width like this virus. Um, we can see the membrane envelope. Um, which is going to surround the viral protein, uh, the viral genome. Um, and we can see that very clearly in this um, image. And so the envelope proteins create this kind of hazy um, halo around the virus particle. And um, scientists, when they first saw these, these um, viruses using electron microscopy, um, they thought it looked like a crown or a halo. And so that's why they call them coronaviruses, because um, corona in Latin means crown or halo. Um, most viruses, most coronaviruses are going to look similar to this. Um, so viruses are simple infectious particles that cannot replicate independently. They are dependent on the cellular machinery within their specific host. 
um, because viruses carry genetic material, um, they reproduce and evolve, but they rely entirely on a host organism for their basic biological functions. Um, they are considered to be on the border of biology and chemistry. So most people would say a virus is not alive, but when it's affecting you, it seems like it is. Um, it seems like it could be pretty alive. Um, the term coronavirus itself um, actually is going to refer to an entire family of viruses. Coronaviruses like SARS-CoV-2 have a single-stranded RNA genome, which is wrapped in a helical capsid, and that's represented by the kind of pink spiral um, you'll see in the picture. A uh, membrane envelope surrounds the capsid. Now that membrane um, is generated from the host membrane. So if we are in our cells, that's our cell membrane that is going to be put around that viral genome and that capsid when the viruses bud out and, um, you know, try to escape the human body to infect, um, you know, our neighbors. Um, embedded within that membrane is going to be um, different proteins. And so these proteins um, are agents that the virus is going to use to help infect cells. They interact with the receptors on the surface of the cells in our respiratory system, um, which lets them invade our cells and take over the cell's machinery and reproduce. And some of the proteins are also really important for um, the virus to bud out and be able to affect other people. And so this membrane envelope with all these viruses, um, that surrounds our capsid, our, which surrounds our RNA genome, and all of these things protect our RNA genome from the outside environment. And so to test for um, SARS-CoV-2, we use the polymerase chain reaction. So in today's medical diagnostics laboratory, we're going to use the PCR to identify the presence of the viral genome. And so this is an incredibly powerful technique that can take the smallest amounts of DNA um, and expand it to be used to be for analysis. And so this isn't a perfect analogy, um, but you can think of it as like a DNA photocopier. So we start with one copy um, and we can end up with millions at the end. And so PCR is going to take the same steps that our cells use to replicate DNA. And so when I teach PCR, I always like to teach it in the context of DNA replication. Um, if you guys, any of you have any hints for teaching PCR, um, you know, feel free to put them in the chat window. Um, you know, we'd love to hear about what you're doing. Now, um, again, I like to teach it like DNA replication. Um, so first, when we're replicating DNA, we need to separate the DNA to two strands. Uh, in the cell, we have the enzyme helicase that's going to unwind the DNA into single strands. In PCR, we actually heat the sample to 94 degrees centigrade, um, which is going to separate the double-stranded DNA. The high heat breaks down the hydrogen bonds between the RNA base pairs, um, and that's known as denaturation. So that takes our double-stranded DNA, breaks those hydrogen bonds, um, and allows us to have single-stranded DNA. Next, if we were in the cell, um, the enzyme primase would come along and build short RNA primers along the single-stranded DNA pieces. And so this allows the enzyme that builds DNA, which is DNA polymerase, to start catalyzing the phosphodiester bonds between DNA nucleotides. So basically that means that it, that primer provides a starting place for DNA polymerase to start linking um, nucleotides to one another, like we were um, linking beads together on a string. Now, DNA can't just start building DNA on its own, so it needs those primers to get started. In, primer, in, in PCR, we actually design these primers to bind and target specific DNA sequences. So in our example, we'll be targeting the um, SARS-CoV-2 genome. Um, we adjust the temperature of our sample to between 40 and 65 degrees Celsius, um, and that's going to be where the thermodynamics of the situation for binding are the best. So... Um, and that's going to, that temperature causes the primers to anneal or bind to the complementary base pairs in the genome. And we call this the annealing temperature or the annealing step. Once the primers are bound, um, DNA polymerase can start building DNA using each strand of DNA as a template, the, the strands you just built as a template. So in replication, um, this would be copying the entirety of the chromosome so that we end up with a perfect copy of each of our 46 chromosomes, the 23 pairs. In PCR, um, we're going to raise the sample temperature up to 72 degrees C, um, which is going to allow the polymerase to attach to those open into the primers and extend or fill in nucleotides, thus creating copies of the section of the original DNA molecule. Now in replication, we're done until the cells divide again. For PCR, 
we're going to keep repeating these steps 25 to 35 times um, in order to create a ton of DNA. And so in the lab, we used a specialized machine called a thermal cycler to automate the changes in temperature. Now, back in the day before a thermal cycler was developed, you used to actually move the samples from water bath to water bath um, to change the temperature to cycle. Um, in the lab, we have a thermal cycler that automates this. And so each cycle um, of PCR is going to double the number of copies of DNA in the tube, which is going to give us many millions of copies of DNA um, before the process is done. And we see an exponential growth of DNA in the sample after each cycle since we're doubling each time. So from two, if we start with two copies, we go from two to four to eight, to 16, 32, and so on. Now, if you want to bring math into your classroom, if you're trying to make a STEM lesson, um, which we all do, um, you know, you can actually have your students calculate the number of copies of DNA present in the sample of your PCR. So if you start with five copies of your template um, and cycle for 25 cycles, how many, do you, how many pieces of DNA do you have in the end? So that would be five to the 25. And so um, I hope to cover PCR more in depth in a live stream. If this is something you guys are interested in, be sure to let me know. Um, in that form, I have the link that's been linked to in our um, live chat window. You can put it in the comments section if you want to see PCR or any other kind of um, live stream. You know, we're happy to show you. Um, now, there is a problem if you've been paying attention. Um, PCR needs a DNA template. So TAC polymerase is a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, meaning that it builds new DNA using old DNA as a template. But if you remember, I told you that SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, and that means that its genome is a single strand of RNA nucleotides linked to one another. So how can we use PCR to, to detect the viral genome? And so here's where one of these really cool biotechnology innovations come into play. And that is going to be um, with a special enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And so again, um, you know, we think of, the, there are actual chemical differences between the RNA and DNA bases and the backbone that connect them, which means that these DNA dependent poly polymerases can't build using it as a template. And that's not surprising given the central dogma of molecular biology, where DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein. Um, we don't talk about RNA making DNA, but there are exceptions to every rule. Um, and this is where um, reverse transcriptase comes into place. And so reverse transcriptase is actually a viral enzyme. And some RNA viruses have this special enzyme, um, which, is, which I may call RT or reverse trans transcriptase. They're interchangeable. Um, and this enzyme uses RNA as a template to create DNA molecules. And so HIV is an example of an, R an RNA virus that has a reverse transcriptase. And so what HIV does is it takes its viral DNA, viral genome, which is an RNA genome, it uses this reverse transcriptase enzyme to create double to create DNA, and then by co-opting the body's machinery, it then integrates its viral DNA into the host genome. Now, now using molecular tech biology techniques. Um, we were able to clone this RT enzyme from a retrovirus, so one of these viruses that takes RNA and goes back um, to DNA. Um, we were able to clone this enzyme using molecular biology techniques, grow it in bacteria, and purify that enzyme from cells. And now in the lab, we can actually use it to make DNA from RNA templates, um, which is great because we can use it in order to detect COVID-19. So what we would do is we would um, take this sample um, that was extracted um, from our patient samples. We would add reverse transcriptase, which will synthesize what's called complementary DNA or cDNA. Um, and that just means it matches up with that RNA genome. Um, a small amount of the cDNA is going to be mixed with our TAC polymerase, um, our DNTPs, and our primers for amplification by PCR. And then our samples are going to be analyzed. So um, it's pretty cool the ways that we can take advantage um, you know, of biological systems and use them in the lab. Um, it's one of the reasons why I love biology so much. Um, so um, let's look again at the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Uh, well, for the first time, we're gonna look at the genome. Um, and again, this is the instruction manual that the viruses uses to replicate and build um, viruses within the human body. There are a couple of enzymes um, within the genome that are used to break down proteins and to build new copies of the, of the genome. Um, and we can see there's an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that's going to use RNA to build new RNA. 
a helicase to unwind, and we see some proteases which break down proteins. Um, but in green, what we see are four main structural proteins for the virus. So we see the N protein, um, which is the nucleocapsid protein, and monomers of this protein are gonna link together to form a helical capsid, which is the protein that wraps around and protects that RNA genome. And then when we look at the virus again, we see those proteins that are embedded in the membrane, um, and those are the spike, the envelope, and the membrane proteins. Um, the spike or S protein um, is going to bind with human cell surface proteins, which allows the virus to infect, inject the genetic, bind to and inject the genetic material into host cells. Um, the M protein is going to coordinate interactions between um, other viral proteins and the host cell factors, which is going to take the human cells and turn them into viral factories. And then the E protein is called a viroporin. And so what the E protein does is it binds with itself and forms channels in the surface of the cells um, that are gonna facilitate viral release. And so here is a blow, blow up of this um, region of the genome where we see our structural proteins. Um, our molecular test that we're talking about today is gonna target one of these genes to determine whether or not the virus is present in a patient sample. Now, um, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to talk about um, some specifics about a commonly used molecular test for COVID-19. Um, now, I do want to say that each test has different targets. Uh, the one that I'm featuring here is in use in the United States, but it is not the only COVID test that's being used in the United States, um, nor am I endorsing this particular test over any others. Um, but this is an example of a COVID test that you could get and, and what the results would look like in the, the protein that we're targeting. And so um, most molecular tests target several locations within the SARS-CoV-2 genome. So if we step back one slide, um, we're gonna target this region within the genome. Um, in, our, in our test, we are targeting two regions within the SARS-CoV-2 N protein gene. Um, as an internal control, um, we amplify the human gene RNase P, which is a housekeeping gene. Um, and a housekeeping gene is a gene that is always turned on in the human body because it's responsible for normal day-to-day -day activities in the cells. Um, but you may be asking, isn't this a test for viral proteins, for viral DNA, for viral RNA? Sorry. Um, well, yes, it is. But remember that our sample came from a swab that was taken with that long Q-tip that goes into the back of the throat. And it was a mixture of human and viral cells. And so when we extract the DNA, uh, the RNA from this sample, we're actually going to extract human DNA as well, which will also be copied into our cDNA library, our collection of cDNAs, and then it can be amplified by PCR. And so, again, we have two sets of primers that are going to look for different regions in the SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid protein gene. We have one set of primers that are going to analyze the human gene, uh, look for the human DNA as our internal control to make sure our test is working. Um, and all three sets of all three of these primer sets are added to one human PCR sample. And the test is going to produce different results depending on whether the virus is present in our patient sample. So we'll see one band from our housekeeping gene if a patient is negative for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, now they may have been infected, but they just don't have the virus in their body at that point. So that's again important to remember um, when we're thinking about the antibody test, uh, the immunoassay versus the nucleic acid test. Now, if a patient is positive, we're going to see three bands. We're going to see two bands from the virus and one from the human patient, if the sample, from the human DNA, if the RNA, if the sample patient is positive. Now, if the internal control is missing or one of our two, um, you know, COVID bands is missing, the results are going to be inclusive and the test must be repeated. So these results can be um, analyzed using fluorescent probes like we see on this slide. So this would be a quantitative PCR assay. Um, where fluorescent probes are going to actually interact with the DNA as it's being replicated by PCR. And we can use a special machine called a um, real-time PCR machine to actually look at the DNA being built in real time um, by these fluorescent signals that happen when the, when the fluorescent probes are binding with the DNA. Um, or we can use electrophoresis, which is what we're doing in, the la in our lab today, in my basement lab. Um, and so, again, because RT-PCR is extremely sensitive and it can detect very low levels of the virus, it is considered the gold standard for SARS-CoV-2 detection. However, since RT 
tests are performed in a medical diagnostics laboratory and it may take several days to get the results even though the test takes a few hours. So that's why after you get your test, it's always important to act like you might have it, you might have the infection, um, and just to be safe with your contacts with other people um, until you know whether or not your sample is positive or negative. So let's bring it back to today's experiment to gel electrophoresis. Um, again, before I, the workshop, I cast our agros gels. Um, that's our science jello. Uh, we place the gel into the gel chamber um, under our electrophoresis buffer. Um, I loaded the samples using an adjustable volume micropipette, put the lid on, um, and then turned on the power supply to generate the force, the current needed to move the, the samples through the electrophoresis gel. And while we were talking about COVID, the samples are separating into different bands based on their size. And so uh, I talk about electrophoresis in depth in a couple of other workshops, but I do just want to give a little bit of an overview of electrophoresis here, um, you know, to talk about what's happening inside the gel. And so um, we add the samples to the wells and we apply current um, to separate our DNA fragments by size. And due to the chemical structure of DNA, and that's the sugar phosphate bands that are going to hold our nucleotides together, um, our DNA backbone has a strong negative charge. So we load our gels near the negative electrode of the gel. Um, we turn on the current, um, and the current is actually gonna push our DNA from the negative side of the gel to the positive side of the gel. As I promised, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the gel itself. Um, and at first glance, our agarose gel is a, looks like a solid at room temperature. Um, when you pick it up, um, it feels like a thick jello. It's still soft, but it's a little less jiggly um, than the jello you may eat as a dessert. Um, at the molecular level, though, this is very porous. Like a, you can think of it like a kitchen sponge, you know, where you have all these micro, these little tunnels that go through um, this sponge. And these tunnels are going to affect the way that different sized DNA molecules can move through the gel and separate into bands. And so as the current is pushing and pulling the DNA fragments through the gel, the molecules have to find their way through the pores. They're gonna to have to twist and turn to get through the channels. And since it's easier for small molecules to move through these, these, these um, tunnels in the gel, large, it's more easy for the, the small molecules to move through the gel than the larger molecules, the DNA is gonna separate into bands by size. Larger molecules are gonna remain near the wells and smaller molecules are gonna move further down the gel. And because the molecules with different sizes, travel at different speeds, the, they become separated and form discrete bands within the gel. So if we're looking for an analogy for electrophoresis, um, we can think about electrophoresis like the steeplechase, which is this crazy race where everyone runs around essentially an Olympic-sized obstacle course. And we can think about the DNA molecules as our racers, as our people running around the track. We have some people that are faster and better at navigating the obstacles than others, but all of the racers are moving around the track in the same direction. We have obstacles across the course. So there are hurdles and pools of water that the racers need to navigate. Um, and these obstacles get in the way of the racers as they're running around the track. So the best racers are fast and they're able to navigate the race more easily than others. And this means that they're gonna finish the course more quickly than their competitors. And so we can think of the racers as the DNA molecules. Um, and they are following, they, they're following their track in a particular orientation. And the directionality of that race is our electrical current. So everybody is running in the same direction, but they are moving at different speeds. And that is because of the obstacles that they are going to um, encounter along the way. And those obstacles are like our um, agros, agros matrix. And so the obstacles are gonna impede the runners from running around the course, um, just like the um, Agarose gel is gonna impede the, the traveling of the DNA through the gel. And so if we look at the results of our DNA electrophoresis experiment, we find smaller bands at the bottom and larger bands at the top. And we're always gonna run a molecular weight marker with bands of DNA size, DNA bands of known size, so that we can determine the sizes of our own known DNA fragments in our experimental samples. But we have one more problem. So DNA is clear and colorless. We can't see our bands um, with the naked eye. And so there, we need to use a, a DNA stain that sticks to DNA to be able to visualize the result. And so there are many DNA stains available for use in the classroom lab, but I'm gonna talk about two of my favorites, which are cyber blue and uh, cyber green and flash blue. Um, 
I almost called it cyber blue and flash green, which would also be very cool. Um, but no, not true. Um, we are talking about cyber safe, which is green and flash blue, which is blue. So cyber safe is a fluorescent dye that is going to bind to our DNA. Um, this is really important um, and it allows us to visualize very low amounts of DNA because each fluorescent molecule is going to bind with the DNA and when it's bound to the DNA um, it is going to label it with a marker and I like using fluorescent DNA stains um, particularly because each DNA molecule is going to be bound by multiple um, dyes and by being bound to the dye um, we're then going to excite this dye that's bound to DNA um, using blue light and the blue light um, excites the fluorescent molecules um, and then it's going to emit a bright green light that we can see using this transilluminator. Now blue light is great to use for, oh that's the, so blue light is great to use for, um, I need to turn off a few more lights, um, for these experiments because it is non-mutagenic, um, whereas UV light can actually break the DNA strands. Um, and it's very sensitive. So when we excite our um, when we excite our gel um, with this light, and it excites the different DNA fragments, um, you know there's an amplification effect. So each bound dye molecule can continue to absorb the light um, and to emit the light. Um, you know I'm getting a little bit of fog because I was running my gel fast and hot. So let me. So hopefully you can see those bands. Um, I'm going to actually just, uh, we're going to let it go. Um, let you, I'll take a, look, take a look at it and I'll, I'll clean it off a little bit more again. And so um, each dye molecule can be continually excited by our um, light. And so we can get very small amounts of DNA. We can visualize it because we're having this amplification effect from the, the fluorescent light. So I, one thing I love about CyberSafe is it's actually in the gel when you start running the experiment. Um, and the, the, um, the instructions are on the slide, but that means that we are actually staining the DNA at the same time that we're running it through the gel so we can get immediate results. Now, um, this does require this blue, this blue light visualization system or a UV visualization system. This is our True Blue 2, um, which is a great system. Um, and, but not everybody might have this system. So they're actually, we, there's actually another dye that I also like to use, um, which is called um, Flash Blue. Um, and Flash Blue is another DNA stain, but this is a visible DNA stain. Um, and that means that we don't need necessarily a special visualization chamber to visualize our DNA. Um, the band, the DNA bands are going to be visual um, be able to be visualized using um, the naked eye because it is again a visual DNA stain. Um, in this case I can actually use the true blue as a white light box though to further kind of amp up those bands so that we can see them more clearly um, more clearly um, than just by um, using um, the naked eye. Um, we don't get the amplification effect that we get with fluorescent dyes, but for experiments like this one, um, the flash blue is sensitive enough to be able to detect all of the bands. For this gel, I used an overnight staining protocol where you dilute the flash blue and soak it overnight. Um, and this is a great option if you have short lab periods. You can soak the gel and come back to it tomorrow. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the cyber stain gel um, just because I love the, um, I love the fluorescence. I think it just looks so cool. Um, you can see the picture of the flash blue gel that is going to be on the screen at this time. Um, so if you want to see what that looks like, again, um, what you'll see is the banding patterns are the same. Again, the um, the sensitivity of the flash blue, of the cyber safe, um, you know, is is what gives it an advantage in that we can see very low amounts of DNA, but they both allow you to be able to um, visualize the results. Um, oh, did I put that on there? Yeah, um, you should be able to see those bands nice and bright and green. 
Um, so again, let's look at the results. So in our first lane, we have our DNA standard marker. Um, that again is a standard so that it allows us to see, to be able to estimate the sizes of our DNA fragments. Um, in our first lane, we have our negative control. Again, that is the one band, the housekeeping gene um, that we would see if our patient is not infected um, by the gene. Um, we should actually see it in all of our samples. Um, if we only see that band, like we see in patient sample one, um, that means that the person is not affected. And so actually I do have, that would be in patient lane five, sorry, not lane four. Um, in our positive control, which is our third lane, um, we have three bands, two of which are from the virus and one from the human. Um, and that's what we see when samples are positive. And then if the internal control is missing, which is like in our patient sample one, um, those results are inclusive, inconclusive and the test should be repeated. So in patient one, we would need to repeat the test. Um, that's lane four. In lane five, we have a negative sample. So that person might have the flu. Um, they might be sick with something else um, or they might just, you know, they might be healthy. And even though they were in contact with someone who may have had um, the COVID, um, they themselves do not have um, the disease. And then in our last lane, um, we can see a positive test result. And that person has all three bands. And so, um, you know, again, these we visualized both of these gels, both the Flash Blue and the Cyber Safe on our True Blue Transilluminator. Um, and that's, you know, it's really nice because this is a multi-use piece of equipment. One thing I learned about it before our last live stream, I think, um, is that you can actually use it for um, GFP transformed bacteria as well, which is, you know, really nice because then you can actually do, you know, three different kinds of, ex those three different kinds of experiments on one light box. Um, and you can actually look using the white light feature. You can also look at auto rads um, or protein electrophoresis gels. And so um, this one piece of equipment has a lot of different uses. And so we've actually come to the end of our experiment. Uh, we've covered a lot of information over the course of this, ex of the, this experiment. Um, we started by talking about SARS-CoV-2, -CoV um, the virus responsible for the pandemic, um, this worldwide pandemic of respiratory infection. Uh, we talked about the principles of molecular testing, so about how PCR um, has evolved into this powerful and versatile technique that can be used in medical diagnostics. Um, and we talked about the special tricks that we need to do. So the integration of this RT enzyme, this reverse transcription step to be able to use PCR to detect the presence of the SARS-CoV-2 genome in patient samples. Um, we, um, what else? So, um, you know, this test is fairly simple and can be done at home, just like I showed you, um, but also in your lab when the schools are back in session. I know it's a little scary, um, even to us who have seen similar outbreaks and understand the science, um, but this is the perfect time to be able to teach your students about virology, epidemiology and medical testing in the context of current events. And so your students may have seen the same news reports that we did. They may be curious to learn more. Um, they may have seen misinformation um, that we want to be able to address. Um, and so um, you can teach your students also about the best places to find information like scientific journals, the CDC and the World Health Organization. And so um, again, Thank you so much for joining us. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. We still have a minute or two left. Um, I will be posting the presentation and the slides over the next couple of days to our website, www.edvotech.com. Um, if you want us to email you when they're available, please be sure to fill out that form. Uh, there's also a little survey in that form. Um, I know a lot of teachers are getting back to class. We wanna make sure to have a time where all of you could join us or even consider your students logging on to join us for our webinars. Uh, our live streams. Um, so again, fill out that form, let us know about you, um, you know, and you know, if you want the slides, let us know. If you want the professional development certificate, let us know. Thank you, Hillary. I'm glad you find these sessions interesting and informative. Um, I am happy to do them. This is, you know, one of my favorite things to do is to be able to work with teachers, um, 
you know, we used to do these um, instruction, we used to do these sessions um, at education conferences um, around the country. Obviously, we're not traveling now, so this is the best way for me to be able to get in touch with you um, to be able to, um, you know, help you learn how to um, integrate these into your classroom and to learn a lot about the background of why these experiments are important. Thank you too, Barry, for, um, you know, showing up. We, we love to have people um, participate in our workshops. And so again, fill out the form. Um, let us know when you want to join us. I don't see any questions. Um, if you have questions, you can always contact us through social media. Um, again, call us 1-800-EDVOTECH. Um, email us info at edvotech.com. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. You see us on YouTube. Um, be sure to like and subscribe. I sound like one of those YouTubers, but I guess I am now. Um, please subscribe. Um, and, you know, just please like our videos. Um, be sure to tune in the next time we do it. Um, you know, and, and we're just really grateful for you joining us today, for taking the time um, to listen. Um, and, you know, we hope to see you in the future at one of our live streams. And, you know, we hope everything gets back to usual so you can really get this biotechnology um, in your classroom in the near future. Um, so if there are no questions, uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, I will see you soon. Well, you will see me soon in another live stream. And I'm looking forward to having you back. Have a fantastic day. Have a fantastic week. Um, and, you know, I'm wishing everybody a safe and, you know, healthy, easy way transition into your school year. Um, so um, have a wonderful day.